This is Rudy Heinzel here at uh, McMaster University on June the 5th, 2004, and it's a special ple- pleasure to have with me Dr. Steve Mann, the widely acclaimed cyber inventor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto. This afternoon, Dr. Mann will be inducted into McMaster University's Alumni Gallery in recognition of his groundbreaking work in the field of cyber technology. Steve Mann grew up in Hamilton and earned three degrees here at McMaster University. Bachelor of Science in Physics in 1987, Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical and Computer in 1989, Master of Engineering in Electrical and Computer in 1992. In 1997, he received a Ph.D. in Media Arts and Sciences from the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now here's a question. Why is Steve Mann not considered by some to be an ordinary human being? I guess you've heard that question sometimes. Well, the answer is that no ordinary human being has invented the world's most advanced wearable computer and worn it almost all his waking hours, you can correct me, Steve, if that's not, for more than the past 20 years. Is that correct? Um, Yeah, well, I guess this is something that I've been working on over the the past 30 years or so, and I guess over the past 20 years I've been, uh, been using a lot of my inventions. He is a true cyber pioneer and explorer. I think that's fair enough to say, and he's sitting across from me now, as you just heard, um, and hanging around his neck uh, are some uh, rather mysterious looking uh, technical uh, items, uh, and uh, in some ways he looks like he could be, in a little ways, he could be somebody from the cast of Star Wars. Is that an unfair statement? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if science comes first or science fiction comes first. It's, it's always that interesting question. Do science fiction get the ideas from scientists or do scientists get the ideas from science fiction? Uh, that's very good. So, Steve, uh, I just want to thank you for being here and, and welcome you back to McMaster. Yeah, it's great to be here. Now, uh, just before we start discussing your, your really fascinating scientific work, and just for the record, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your early life in, in Hamilton. You, you, were, you were born here in Hamilton? Yeah, I was born in Hamilton. And w- where did you go to school here? Uh, well, I, I went to McMaster University for my, for my undergrad. I got uh, two degrees at McMaster, one in, in uh, engineering physics, and then I got another undergraduate degree in electrical. Right. And then I ended up staying uh, for my master's degree in electrical as well under the direction of Simon Haken. Mm-hmm. And back then, uh, in your, let's say your public school or your high school days, uh, they were in Hamilton as well, yeah, were yeah. they? Uh, were you already doing some experimenting back then? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, well, certainly since my childhood, I've been experimenting with different things. I mean, even before I started kindergarten, I was building electric circuits and things like that. And I started early on with this notion of, of uh, trying to get rid of the boundary between, you know, what we, the technological framework and, and, and ourselves. And I think of, um, I, I sort of thought of clothing as, as a building for a single occupant, and you sort of, sort of architecture of one, and uh, a lot of these ideas. My dad worked in a men's clothing company, so I kind of, and, and my own interests were, were sort of electrical-oriented things, so I kind of got got into these ideas of, of, of personal space and a, a kind of existential framework of self-determination and mastery over our own destiny based on kind of on the, on the ideas of, of architecting one's personal space. Steve, what do you remember about uh, your undergraduate uh, days at McMaster back then when you were, were you, were you a typical engineering student? I mean, you know, the kind of people that uh, get very involved in Kipling events and go to the downstairs, John, quite regularly after a hard <laughs> day and night of studying, or, or were, were you a little more unconventional in terms of uh, these uh, sort of engineering stereotypes? Yeah, I guess it's funny because uh, there's the, the, the engineering being, being critical of the arts, and yet uh, at that time, you know, I was... Uh, you know, being asked to exhibit my work in art galleries and stuff like that, and so it was. It was, uh, you know, the things that I was doing in terms of engineering were addressing uh, what many people thought to be important social questions, mm-hmm. cultural, social, you know, techno-social questions, and so um, I kind of unwittingly became, uh, uh, you know, a cyborg artist of, of sorts uh, mm-hmm. in the eyes of, of certain people who invited me to put the work in in galleries, and I I said, fine, if you want to call it art, that's okay with me. (laughs) Right, right. Who were some of the uh, professors at 
in those undergraduate days that, that had some influence over, over you? I guess it's hard to say. I would say uh, the most influential person in my life, uh, in my McMaster life, was Simon Haken. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think it was largely his love of, of um, you know, the material and his, his, his love of the students, I think, that really uh, inspired me, um, you know, as a, as a wonderful person, a uh, very warm-hearted uh, human uh, who also... Uh, was well versed in the technology. I think he was a great example of somebody who brought a human element to the mathematics and the and the theoretical uh, frameworks of engineering. And then you went on to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, that must have been an interesting uh, experience. Can you say a little bit about that? Your time at MIT. I kind of thought that when I went down to MIT, I would be immediately accepted because I'd heard stories about this place that is a geek haven of the world where all the social mis misfits and techno freaks kind of <laughs> You thought go. you would blend right in there and nobody would notice you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I thought I'd just fit right in. But when I got down there, I sort of realized that it's a lot like anywhere else and it's really not a whole lot different than anywhere else. Is that right? Is that right? But still, you must have met some... Uh, very interesting and important people there, such as uh, Noam Chomsky. Did you ever have any contact with him? Yeah, I had a lot of discu interesting discussions with him, and and uh, and again, it was interesting. I thought, you know, when I was talking to him, I thought, you know, here's somebody who's, who can change the world, and I guess I had really high hopes, you know, and I was telling him about my technology and and hoping to get some really interesting ideas from him, you know, and he, he said that, you know, your invention is just like the invention of the printing press. It's going to be used by the powers that be to sustain the status quo. Ah, so he had a bit of a cynical view of uh, <laughs> what you were doing. Not that what you were doing wasn't important and uh, uh, very complex uh, in terms of technology, but it's just how it would be used in a political sense. Well, I kind of thought that what I what I what I could present was a a positive force. You know, I was explaining to him my idea of surveillance, which is inverse surveillance. Surveillance is you know French for watch from above, and so it, it's this God's eye view or eye in the sky is what surveillance is watching down on us. And surveillance then is this sort of uh, replacing you know the the position of God with other humans who watch down upon us, and uh, so surveillance you know is watching from below you know sure. bring the camera down to eye level and you know mm -hmm. the Rodney King beating is a great example of surveillance you know mm -hmm. reverse hierarchy, but it goes beyond of course citizens photographing police and passing photographing cab drivers and shoppers photographing shopkeepers but to ask a broader question is what happens when individuals uh, the the art of recording an activity from a participant you know by a participant in the activity and so this this framework of surveillance what I call glogging or cyborg log mm -hmm. uh, you know cyborg logging um, is you know I, I had explained you know I was explaining to Chomsky you know this this idea that I had, you know, and I thought this would solve a lot of the problems that he's encountering or talking about, but, but I, I guess I was, I was, you know, at first I was kind of put off, you know, by this, well, the, the idea that this technology could be just like anything else, and then that, but that really got me thinking a lot and, and got me sort of think, thinking about how technology alone can't really solve the problem and, and that we have to understand things in the broader intellectual landscape that we as engineers can't just build a bridge and solve life's problems we got to understand how our inventions affect the world and what mm -hmm. the how this might work so as responsible inventors we also probably should take an active role in bringing our inventions out into the world in the right manner